Welcome to Brewing the Facts, a show where I delve into some interesting beer facts throughout history from medieval brewing to the origin and rules of beer pong. Today I finished the process of my homebrew, Zaitan 7, my raspberry jalapeno wheat ale. I will be showing you the bottling process and the finished product, and I will also be talking about a trend when soccer teams from around the world decided to brand their own beers, with some people even collecting the now novelty cans. The practice of soccer teams, or football teams for anyone not in the United States, approaching craft breweries to make a beer specifically for the team or to make a specialty can for the team goes all the way back to the 1960s. An early attempt was in Italy with Serie A team Inter Milan's Werwer beer that came in 1982. While some of these beers were only limited time releases, there is one collector named Tiago Polzado who has collected many of these team-sponsored brews. Polzado started a blog called Lotus Football Club that shows off and describes his personal collection. The local news in Brazil even did a story of Polzado's endeavor, which is on YouTube in Portuguese. Globo.com also has an article about the collection. Polzado from Sao Paulo began collecting cans, bottles, and mini kegs in 2010 of beer that represent football clubs and national teams. He already had thousands of cans from an earlier general brewing collection that he started in the 90s, but he honed in on just football-themed beer items about 11 years ago. I know many college kids who made beer pyramids or kept beers they drank on a shelf, and of course Untapped is an app that allows people to catalog the beers they have drunk, but collecting over 10,000 cans of a similar theme and displaying them is much more impressive. Some of the beers in Pulsado's collection include Argentina's Boca Juniors from 1993, by Genesee Brewery, Japan's Verta Kawasaki from 1996 by Suntory, Turkey's Basiktas from 1997 by Tuborg in Denmark, Denmark's FC Copenhagen from 2010 by Carlsberg, Germany's Hamburg from 2013 by Holsten, and one of the oldest cans in his collection goes all the way back to 1967. The German club can, Eintracht Braunschweig, launched a series of beer cans after a club title that year. He also also has cans that represent Saudi teams, but since alcohol cannot be consumed there, a 1990 can of the club El Litihad is just a malt drink. He posts every new beer that he collects on the blog with a photo of the beer. You can actually buy some of the beers he owns from his blog as he seems to have some duplicates. But they are very pricey, of course, depending on the rarity of the cans. Think Beanie Babies, only way cooler and not a fad because, you know, beer and football. So the first thing we need to do when bottling is move the beer from the secondary fermenter into a bottling bucket so that I could use a bottling siphon on this spigot that's right here. This also allows you to filter the beer as well. Since I used jalapenos and raspberry puree, I needed to make sure I filtered out all of that so only liquid is left. The dead yeast slurry on the bottom of the fermenter is also filtered out. Some yeast does remain and that yeast will eat the bottling sugar to carbonate the brew when it's done. Sugar and yeast share a relationship much like beer and soccer in the 80s and 90s. The UK's Premier League had a few teams in 1987 try to get in on the action of teaming up to make some brews with other places, and that didn't go so well. While people love beer and a large portion of the world loves football, fans of England's Premier League also hate commercialism of their beloved clubs. And that was apparent in 1987 when Essex entrepreneur Kenny Wilmot joined forces with Cornish Brewery's David Gillian to make deals for four of the five biggest clubs, or at least what some people call the biggest clubs. Tottenham Hotspur did have a deal with Holston already at the time, so only Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool, and Everton were in the Cornish Brewery deal. These clubs were looking for ways to make money after being banned from European competition following the Hazel disaster. For those that don't know, the Hazel disaster was a tragic event before the 1985 European Cup final between Liverpool and Juventus. Juventus fans escaped from a breach by Liverpool fans, but then were pressed up against a collapsing wall at Hazel Stadium in Brussels, Belgium. 
There were 39 fatalities, mostly Italians and Juventus fans, and more than 600 people were injured. Several stories of this incident are disputed, but Liverpool fans apparently breached a fence that formed a neutral zone, and Juventus fans tried to run away. Unfortunately, fans already up against the wall were crushed to death before the wall collapsed, which allowed others to escape. 14 Liverpool fans were found guilty of manslaughter and were sentenced to three years in prison, and European clubs were banned from UEFA competitions until 1990, with Liverpool being banned for three more years. Many call that the darkest hour in UEFA competition history. But a few years later, club owners were already thinking about ways for more revenue to help with the lost money due to the ban. And in came Wilmot and Gillian. Wilmot's son Paul said his dad believed this to be the cash cow. He was also in contact with NFL teams and Barcelona. Liverpool had its Super Reds and Everton had its premium lager. Manchester United held a launch party on December 1st, 1987 at Old Trafford for its Red Devil lager. Celebrities were there. Senior club of Officials, including Chairman Michael Edwards were there. Many models were there as well. The next day, a back page story in everyone's most hated newspaper, the Daily Mail, talked about how appalling it was for clubs to do this. Police had linked alcohol to trouble at stadiums, so there was moral outrage in the public, and the Daily Mail accused the clubs of encouraging hooliganism. Liverpool's chief executive Peter Robinson and Edwards both defended the deal. They didn't think it would increase drinking. Robinson said Super Reds wouldn't be for sale on match days. Edwards talked about how 18 clubs were already sponsored by breweries at the time, but it didn't help that United was actively looking for ways to increase sales, such as getting fans to collect 640 pop-top rings from the Red Devil cans to get into a game for free. That certainly wasn't going to change the minds of people who thought the Red Devil Lager was actually the devil. News of the marketing scheme and the initial backlash meant the Premier League team deals were dead and it only took 24 hours. There were a few orders that were made prior to this, so there were some that could be collected by Tiago Polzato, as we mentioned before. Edwards did come up with the Red Tribe beer nine years later with much less backlash, though no one talks about it as much as the failed Red Devil. Beer sponsorship has since dried up in the Premier League with only six teams using it in 1994 and that going all the way down to one team by 2016. Right now, there are no teams sponsored by beers. Remember, it is a rule that you cannot drink beer at your seat during a Premier League game to reduce fighting and other incidents. Too bad Wrigley Field in Chicago doesn't adhere to those rules. I am now boiling some water to dissolve the sugar I am using in this brew. You can use corn sugar, regular sugar, brown sugar, maple syrup, agave, pretty much anything uh, that has sugar in it to carbonate a beer, even honey. Uh, the choice will sometimes add flavors to the beer, and each type has a specific water sugar ratio to follow. Some create off flavors that need to be aged out. Maple syrup, for example, probably needs longer than the three weeks uh, it normally takes to carbonate bottled beer, otherwise a woody flavor develops. I am using brown sugar for this beer, and then I will need it to cool down to room temperature before adding it to my bottling bucket, otherwise I risk killing off the yeast, which would leave the beer flat. Many fans, of course, thought their clubs would be killed by greedy owners looking to commercialize their teams with beer sponsorships. Like we've talked about before, teams in the Premier League did use beer sponsorships in the past, however. And they even made kits or uniforms to show off these sponsorships. New fans of the Premier League, or those who saw the decline, wouldn't even think about a beer company being on a kit or uniform nowadays. But just like some recreational sports teams, many soccer kits did don a brewery back in the day. In fact, during the 1992-1993 to season, 18% of all Premier League sponsorships were alcohol-related, second only to electrical at 23%. One of those teams was Blackburn Rovers, which had McEwen's lager right on the front of the shirt in big letters for their 1994 to 1995 Premier League Championship season. Newcastle United, of course, had Newcastle Brown Beer on their jerseys for several decades. Holston was big for Tottenham Hotspur in the 1980s, and Carlsberg was showcased on Liverpool kits for 18 seasons, including the 2005 Miracle at Istanbul. A Thai beer company named Chang was big 
big with Everton for 13 seasons. One of the really sad kits might be Chelsea's from 1994 to 1997, when he decided it was a good idea to have cores on the front of their jerseys. Might as well just have had Agua on the front. I am now bottling my beer, making sure to leave a little room at the top for the CO2 so the bottle doesn't explode from the pressure once the sugar actually eats the extra yeast. In once it. I'm done, I have to store this delicious beer in a dark place for three weeks before it is ready. But I always like to taste what I have at all stages, so I actually have a little bit of uncarbonated beer for me to try here. You could also add a light pilsner with a little flavor to the flat beer to kind of give an idea of what it will taste like when carbonated, but bottoms up. Oh yeah, you definitely get the maltiness, but the nice flavors is a little bit of a burn from the jalapeno, not a lot, and there's a little sweetness from that raspberry. It tastes like raspberry jalapeno jam that isn't as sweet. It, it, I think this beer is going to be very good once carbonated. And the process of brewing can be very fun, despite all these steps I've been showing you this whole season. And of course, the need for a little knowledge. Hopefully you've gotten some of that knowledge from me and you can get the rest online or uh, if you want to go to school or any of those types of things. But Tottenham Hotspur is a soccer team that also must know this all too well because the Spurs opened up their own microbrewery. London-based Beavertown and Tottenham Hotspur are beginning a new soccer and beer relationship in Europe. Beavertown Brewery's story actually began in 2011 with owner Logan getting his start as a home brewer. In 2012, Beavertown Brewery was opened in a barbecue restaurant, Duke's Brew & Q. This is where Neck Oil, Smog Rocket, Smoke Porter, and 8 Ball Rye IPA were born, which are three of the flagships. In 2014, Jen Merrick joined as a head brewer and the operation moved to Tottenham Hale in a large facility where canning can also begin. In 2018, it was announced that a new partnership between Beavertown and the Tottenham Hotspur Club was coming, and with a new stadium, a microbrewery and tap room was built, which is the first stadium brewery in the Premier League. A new beer was born in 2020, one of our own, which is a British IPA, and other Beavertown beers are available at the marketplace inside the stadium. There is also a bar that happens to be the longest bar in Europe at 65 meters. There is a reported 20 23,000 pints sold per match. Who said beer and football didn't go together? It's been just about over two months and my Zaiton 7 Raspberry Jalapeno Wheat Ale is finally done. It's so exciting when you get to taste the beer that you've been brewing. You know, obviously when I started, you know that it's gonna be a process. It's gonna be several months. It takes a lot of patience, but when it finally, the finished product finally comes and you're excited about it, it it's just such a great feeling. And I thank you all for joining me on this journey and, and seeing some of the process of me making this beer. I hope to make other seasons as well making other beers, showing you different things, uh, showing you some of the recipes that I will make, and uh, going through some more interesting facts. So, you know, cheers, thanks a lot for, for joining. Please like and subscribe. And now I get to taste this delicious concoction. Oh yeah, exactly like I thought. It has a kind of a jalapeno raspberry jam taste to it. Not so sweet. It's got that, that spiciness in the beginning. You get the green of the jalapeno. Uh, you, you definitely get a malty profile. You get a little bit of the yeast. Uh, the balance is what I always look for. And I definitely enjoy that spiciness that the jalapeno gives in there. Balancing that, that sort of sweet sourness that, that the raspberry puree gives. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm definitely satisfied with this. This has been Brewing the Facts. See you next time.